morning. Continue to pray for Eric, and uh, I'm filling in. We even updated the date I see on the sermon. This was originally from about three years ago. But this is a central passage in First John <clears throat> that describes the contrast between living for Christ by his grace or serving the world. And the contrast is very stark. And though in, in various cases outwardly may look this way, that way, or the other way, in regard to the basic motivations of what makes us uh, live and believe, breathe and believe and motivates us, has to do with very hard issues. We're living for Christ and loving him, or we're living for the world and loving its sinful pleasures. Let me read the passage. First John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. Now here's the problem, if you live for the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Now let's start right in with this, 1 John 2, 15. We'll, we'll do the first part of that verse. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. And we have, as I say on the slide here, an imperative, which means it's a command from God. And God uh, commands what, in keeping with his revealed moral will. In Sunday school, I was mentioning that I've been rereading uh, Martin Luther's book, The Bondage of the Will, which is difficult reading, but I'm about half through my reread, taking notes, fold, folding over corners, putting paper clips in, underlining, Boy, this would be a good thing to explain. And this kind of issue comes up here. It, let's just say you read this and you, you don't know Christ. And it says, do not love the world or the things of the, of the world. And it's a command. And in Luther's dispute with Rome, Rome's issue, as expressed through Erasmus and through Diatribe, was... God only commands what humans already have the ability to do. So therefore, there's no point commanding something unless we're just full of ability and just can do it. And Luther disputed that vociferously and using many different illustrations and from various verses that they try to use for, for proof text. And what Luther proved was that the command to be a certain way doesn't imply that fallen sinners already have what they need. It implies that this is the law of God to drive us to the gospel. What this is designed to do, according to Luther, and I think according to the Bible, according to Paul, because Luther wasn't an apostle, but Paul was, and John was, is that if we think that human ability is what the gospel's about, we're deceived. What Jesus taught called up even the most, called up short, even the most hyper pious of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And he was showing them that their piety was deficient and they were facing God's wrath. And the idea is that if we take careful stock of this, and if we learn what God is truly saying, which by God's grace I hope we do here, we'll realize we need something different. We need God to do a work of grace that will change us from the inside out. Because the way we were, we were dead in sin and loving the things of the world. But God says, don't do that. Meaning, we really do need Christ in the gospel. So it's an imperative. The word for world here is cosmos. And I'll show you on a later slide that this has a range of meaning. And we need to get that right or we'll maybe join a group that's not right on. I did one time. 
But it, here it means, in this context, the world, it is sinful alienation to God. After the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, these three things that we'll be studying, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, most of pride of life, motivates the entire world. And in this particular sermon, I don't go into Genesis, but one could. In fact, you could go back there and see that the, the three things that enticed Eve were really the same things. Desirable to make one wise, beautiful, okay, to let good for food, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and so on. Oh, look at how beautiful it is. Look at how wonderful it is. I can have my own wisdom. I don't need to depend on God. And you can also see these three things that we'll be getting to in the temptations of Jesus. But the world, since the very time of the fall, has been living for self, and sinners are loving the world. We may have a different version of what that's going to look like, but sinners love the world. The sinful world hates God, and it hates his people. And thus, Christians are always in conflict with the world we live in. Not because we're taught by Christ to be mean and nasty. We're not. We're to be kind, considerate, loving, and so on. But we have a whole different view of reality. We believe different. We're serving Christ, not the world. And our goals and dreams are totally different. We believe the world's passing away. The people around us think the world has to be turned into some kind of a paradise through the process of social and spiritual evolution. We think that's baloney. And so then they think we're the problem and we're evil because we're not getting with the program. We're the resistors. We don't want to go along with the belief that the world is going to be evolving into something better if we only get with it. No, the things in the world we'll see momentarily. Now, I think we can learn something about what this means for us in Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, his so-called high priestly prayer. Let me just read, if you uh, want to take note of what verses we're going to look at here, John 17, 15 through 17. John 17, 15 through 17. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. That Jesus prays, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And then look at verse 17, very, very important. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So here is gospel-centered sanctification. The very word of God sanctifies us. We need, as I've heard others say, megadoses of the word of God, lest the thinking of the world cloud our minds. And as the thinking of the world is what we got to get rid of, that will be the way that ultimately, by the truth of the Word of God, we get rid of the motivations of the world. People are motivated by worldly things because they think like the world. And if you're thinking this is all there is and I've got to get whatever satisfaction or fulfillment there is now, and I better get right at it any way I can, you're thinking like the world. But if you know the truth, Jesus prayed that we would, we're still in the world. We're still there with people who live for the world and think like the world and are motivated by the world. But if we know the truth, the truth of God informs our minds so that we realize, I can't be like this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. I need God to change me. Life has to be different because we know Christ. And then we do have and will have until the rapture or we go through death to be with Christ, an adversarial relationship with the world, not because we're mean and nasty and 
hard to get along with, but because we have a different system of belief and values. We see that in John 15. I'm going to, if you want to take note, John 15, 18, and 19. John 15, 18, and 19. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Don't be shocked. The world hates you. You don't think like the world, so you don't fit in. Verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Oh, yes. Over the years of ministry, how many times I've talked to people who backslid and then realize how bad that is. And they've reported that when they backslide, all the old sinful, wicked friends op take them back with open arms. Ah, we see you finally have sense. You finally got away from those religious fanatics. You finally come to your senses. Come on, we're going to have a big party. Party with us. And so the world is always there ready to love its own. But if we're faithful to Christ, we're not compatible. And the world hates us. So let's look at uh, the last part of verse 15. And it's again part of the imperative, which I'm agreeing with Luther. The imperatives are the law telling us why we need Christ. They're not implying self-help or human ability, they actually want to show us human need. Dead sinners don't make themselves alive. God makes people alive. Remember that. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So here's a test that we have to think about. If I love the things that John's about to describe in the next verse, and that's what makes me tick, Where's the love of God in me? Why am I so compatible with this world that I supposedly left when I came to Christ? That's why we need to teach the whole counsel of God so these things are always in front of us, reminding us of who we are and what we need God to do for us. I'm going to make a statement. This is my statement. The love of the world is a deep-seated motivation it drives people and determines what they will believe and do. A deep-seated motivation that drives the lost and determines what their lives are going to look like. And so the world is in a sinful rebellion against God. So one more statement. Once we know the love of God, we realize that we cannot go on living for the lusts of the sinful world. Our beliefs and attitudes must change. And as I showed you from the high priestly prayer, Jesus prayed, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is true. And truth, I mean. And there's many other interactions about that. In John 8, Jesus said, spoken the truth to people and they decided to believe it they were going to believe in him but then he said if you continue in my word you'll be my disciples indeed and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free that's in John 8 but then they became irate because what Jesus told them was that they're not free and they said We've never been in bondage to anybody. Who are you to tell us we're not free? They had believed in him with mental assent. But Jesus said, no, you're not free. You need to continue in my word. Be disciples. No, 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 we don't need that. We've never been in bondage. We're Abraham's children. These were Jewish people. He was, And a huge debate happens in John 8. You want to read that? So, I'm sure you have. Oh, it's a fantastic session. And then eventually they're wanting to stone Jesus, who they previously believed in. 
And he says, you're of your father, the devil. You're saying, well, we have Abraham for a father. No, no, you, you got it wrong. And boy, it was a very strong contrast and, a, and a confrontation. But it doesn't do to just put a label follower of Jesus and have nothing change on the inside. Once we know the love of God, we know we cannot go on living for the lusts of the sinful world. How do we know the love of God? Some, well, this is, I covered it, I preached through 1 John a while back, but eventually I went to 1 John 4, 10, which says this, in, in this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It means the blood of Jesus appeases God's wrath against sin for those who believe. We didn't pull ourselves on by our bootstraps, as the old saying goes, and start loving God. He first loved us. And that says that in 1 John 4, 19. He loved us. And that is objective public knowledge. The love of God for even the sinful human race is on public display through the cross. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him cannot perish but have eternal life. And so that's public truth. The love of God is public truth. But it's not designed to tell us, well, that's good. God's a God of love, so therefore nothing bad can ever happen. Because notice in even first, excuse me, in John three sixteen, should not perish. I remember a debate between Walter Martin and a famous uh, liberal skeptic, uh, who was a religious one, a Christian religious liberal, and he quoted John three sixteen in order to get a test of the mic, and so the Christian who was debating him said, "Oh, I see you like." John 3.16, it was Bishop Spung. That's who it was. He was debating. He says, do you believe that anybody is in danger of perishing eternally? He wouldn't say yeah. He wouldn't answer that. He likes the love, but he doesn't want to admit anybody's going to perish. You know, there's a lot of people like that. Oh, yeah, tell us God's got to love. It's all warm and fuzzy and romantic and idyllic. and uh, I like that. But you're perishing, you're headed for hell if you don't repent. Well, you, you, I, I can't stand you Christians, you're so negative. Why do you always have to talk about those kind of things? The God I know wouldn't ever do that. Yeah, that's true, because you don't know God. The God you know is not the real God of the Bible. There's the problem. Let's go to verse 16a, 1 John 2. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. And then we'll do the second part later. And this all here is in summary form telling us what in a big picture motivates the world. And because it happened in the garden with Eve, and it happened when Jesus went out for 40 days of fasting, the same three categories can be seen in the devil's temptations, which are called, when he finish all of his temptations. Uh, you see this as a summary that's very useful that we can see what may be motivating anyone who doesn't know God, or us if we don't know God, or us being tempted if we're not going to live like Christians. Okay, So here's what the world has to offer. And the offer comes like the temptation in the Garden of Eden and like the temptation in the wilderness with Jesus. Here's what you need. Has God said? Why listen to God? Let me tell you how it is. This is what Satan does. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Now there's ways of summarizing this that help us. Okay, the lust of the flesh is what feels good. 
The loss of the eyes is what looks good. The boastful pride of life is what makes us think that we're good, which seems good to the carnal mind. It's boastful. Look at me. Look how great I am. So this is a comprehensive list of what motivates the world. And there's a definite article with each one of these. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. So that's a good literal translation here for the New American Standard. The word lust, apothemia, means a strong desire. A strong desire, so that that's what I need. That's what I want. That's what I got to have. That's what it is all about. And so what is the flesh? What is the flesh here? And in this context, the word flesh means the person separated from God and living in alienation. Let me say that again and then explain it. The whole person separated from God and living in alienation from him. A lot of people think the flesh simply is the physical body. And so there's a sorry history in church history of people thinking they could get rid of the flesh by severe treatment of the body. And literally there were people that would have somebody whip them or they'd hang themselves on shackles up against a granite wall in a monastery that would suck the heat out of their body thinking they could kill the flesh. And so solitude and fasting, long periods of fasting and self-harm, um, literally, literally hurting themselves thinking they could kill the flesh. And it was all to no good. And frankly, those who did this, you can read this in church history, I have a good church history book that outlines some of the extremes they went to. They never got rid of the flesh. You can't get rid of lust by beating on yourself. You could be in a solitary cell and self goes in there with you. Some of them literally lost their minds. I need to write an article about uh, solitude, silence, and stillness, and why it's not what God has prescribed for Christians. I did the one on Neagram. That's what they prescribed. That is a good way to destroy your life. Now i got to write the articles that I just told you I was going to. And it's still summer. Can a, can a fisherman write an article in the summer? Well, I did once. I guess I can do it again. And now Jessica heard it, so she'll make me do it. <laughs> she said, we need an article for CIC. But I, I need to deal with that because that's what's being prescribed in Bible colleges for Christians. Go sit in solitude. That's not going to get rid of anything. Alienation from God doesn't go away because you're all alone. Alienation from God doesn't go away because you're inactive. Alienation from God doesn't go away because you're silent and you don't say anything. It's all for naught. And so these lusts are all about the motivation of the world and it's part and parcel of being alienated from God, being born dead in sin. We saw that in Ephesians 2, for you are dead. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and Adam all die. Being dead doesn't go away because you sit in a monastery. You're still dead. You need something different. You need Christ. Boastful, in the Greek, is alazonia, and the same is used in the book of James. And if you want to take note, James 4, 15, and 16. If you can turn quickly, that's fine too. James 4, 15, and 16. Boasting is a kind of pride that arises from one's position, possessions, or status in this world. 
position, possessions, or status. Look at me. Look at who I am. I'm important. There's a guy in the Bible, Daniel, who learned a good lesson about that. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? I love, don't you love that? Don't you love the Bible? You can't learn it all. You're always learning and you feel like it's all there for us. But you spend your whole life studying and you're still seeing things, learning things. Nebuchadnezzar, this is Babel on the great that I built with my hands. And he's, he's going to, and what happened to him? He went crazy and ended up eating grass like a cow. But he came to his senses and he honored God. Who are we living for? James 4.15, instead you ought to say, this is what Nebuchadnezzar learned, frankly, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. We don't know the future. We don't. We have things we would like to do, and maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. It's okay to have plans. It's okay to decide I want to buy a house or build a a structure or do this or do that. It's not saying you can't have plans and you can't execute plans, but it's telling us what kind of attitude we have while we do it. We ought to say, if the Lord wills. That's not wrong. The word of faith people say, if you ever say, if the Lord wills, you're a failure and you won't get what you want, it's your own fault. Never say that. You command God to do what you tell him to do. That's what they say. It's a big lie. Because James says, you should say, if the Lord wills. Because we're not God. We don't know what the future holds. We will live and also do this or that. We don't boast. Let's go to the last part of 1 John 2.16. 2.16b, still in the New American Standard Bible. <clears throat> Is not from the Father, but from the world. So, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life, it's not from the Father. You can't put a positive spin on this. You can't take these lusts and massage them and put a religious Christian verbiage to them and make it sound like it's a good idea. Because it's not from God. It has a wrong source. It's from the lost and sinful world. Every thing that's an expression of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life has been done in church history in the name of Christianity. From bad motivations and abuse of people. So it started the Reformation. The lust of the eyes. We've got to have St. Peter's Cathedral. It's got to be glorious. It's got to be gold gilded. We need lots of money. We need the money from all the very poor people that can't even afford bread because we got to have this thing and we have this glorious structure, the lust of the eyes, and we can say, this is Christianity. All you pathetic losers. never changes. And it, so it goes. This is what God wants, they say. They start cults where people are abused. And so on. It's not for God. There's a strong contrast. The word but, the, the particular Greek word there, denotes a strong contrast. It's not from God, it's from the Father, but it's from the world. James 1, 13 or 14 really is an appropriate cross-reference. James 1, 13 and 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. That's what James says. And in verse 17 of James 1, every good thing that is given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow 
what comes from God. Elsewhere, James said, wisdom from above is peaceable, pure, gentle, teachable, reasonable, without hypocrisy, and so on. God isn't capricious. God isn't playing games with us. God's never trying to harm us. His gifts sanctify us and change us. The lusts of the world will destroy us. So that's what we learn there. Let's go to verse 17. 1 John 2, 17, again from the New American Standard Bible. Very important fact we got to know. The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. The world truly is passing away. And history is, in fact, going somewhere. I've been emphasizing this because the deception in the religious world right now is so utterly harmful and pervasive that things that are utterly antithetical to the gospel and the Bible and Christ and Christianity are being taught in so-called Christian uh, institutions of education that are basically saying the opposite of what we're studying here in the Bible. They're claiming that, you're, that there's such a thing as social and spiritual evolution. That rather than heading toward judgment, which is what passing away is all about here, live for lust, go to judgment, they're saying the world is evolving into paradise. And the reason it hasn't got there already is these fundamental Christians aren't cooperating. We talked about that in Sunday school. And when I wrote that article about this thing that's coming into Bible colleges and universities, this a neogram, they have fundamentally a pagan worldview. There's not one thing in these teachings that they are foisting upon our children that says that the end of history comes with judgment, which is the most fundamental and basic idea that Christians have always had from the Judeo-Christian Word of God. God. The history begins with creation, it's linear, it ends with judgment. A lot happens in between. In the center point is the cross, coming of Christ. You send your children for a lot of money to some place that's supposed to be Christian, and they're telling your daughter or your son, don't worry, there's no future judgment. Everything's evolving into paradise. That's what there's that's what's going on. That's emergent. I wrote a book about that. And they say it. And the people running these things don't have a clue about what the problem is or they're part of the problem. Which is sadly more likely. I was doing a debate with one of the emergent leaders live on radio some years ago. And the guy debate, I was debating, Doug Paget, was there with a fellow who was from the church that Doug had grown up in and come from. And the fellow says, well, uh, of course we agree on all the essentials like this substitutionary atonement. And Doug just sat there and didn't say anything. And I looked over at the guy who said that. And I said, you don't understand, Doug doesn't believe in substitutionary atonement. His eyes got about this big. What? A guy from our evangelical church doesn't believe in substitutionary atonement? He looked over at Doug and Doug says, he just shook his head. No, I don't. No, I don't. At least they're honest. The emergent people all told me they don't believe in future judgment. I asked them, no, we don't believe that. So why would you believe any of this? The slide here 
1 John 2.17, the world passing away, they just threw that one out. It's not, that's not going to happen. So the world's not passing away, but it's evolving into some master race or some master future spiritual elite ones. Then why wouldn't you live for the lusts of the world? It's not going to pass away. But if you're a Christian and you believe the word of God, it says that the world is going to end and there will be a judgment, then you think twice about who you're living for. It won't all just get better. There is a coming judgment. So this isn't just religious talk or some theology lessons for some certain seminary students. Dear ones, this is life and death, and this is the future of your families. What they're going to hear, I'm not saying you're saved because you're in a Christian family, but wouldn't it be awful to be in a Christian family and be sent off to hear worldly doctrine in the name of Christ? What would that be all about? How confusing would that be? At least they should know what Christians believe. Begins with creation, ends with judgment. Linear. It's not spiraling upward like a staircase to heaven, as one song said. It's transitory. So the Christian's goal is to honor God by living for him. And Jesus is the only way that will happen. How can we do the will of God and live lives that are pleasing to God? Jesus said in John 8, 29, uh, this is very important, John 8, 29, and, he's, and he who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone. Notice Jesus said, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Which one of us could say, I always do everything that's pleasing to God. We would be called up short. I wouldn't want to say that because I'm needing continual cleansing. I need God to change me. Only Christ is sinless. Only Christ always did the things pleasing to God. We need to be found in Christ if we're going to be found pleasing to God. Notice in John 6.38, I have it listed out here on the PowerPoint, where I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so that would be living by faith and trusting Christ and living with a value system that's eternal and not temporal and transitory, and so on. Now let's have some applications to this. And so we want to think about what, also about what Christ did for us. We have communion today. Now I'm going to point out the range of meaning. The word cosmos, world, doesn't always denote just the sinful aspect of it. It's also a place where we live right now. And then we must be committed to God's will and we escape the world's lust by the promises of God. You knew I'd get to those, what didn't you? I'm always talking about the promises of God. What a comfort they are. Now here's a slide as we go to the next one here that I made a long time ago, and I've used it several times. Um, I was confused about this, and I got some great help from a Bible college teacher who explained it to me, and it was very revolutionary for me. As new Christians, uh, Diane and I joined a group where we were hoping to escape from living in what they call, that group called Babylon. And the leader of the group would talk about getting out of Babylon, and he had versions of it. There's religious Babylon, which would be Bible college, the church, anything normal. Economic Babylon, which was having a job and owning a business, okay, and then there was spiritual Babylon, which was the various uh, demons and things we need to be delivered from. And the idea of the way to get out of Babylon was to join a Christian commune and live together. Now, it's not a new idea, as old as monasticism is. But we joined, it was an evangelical group and believed in the Trinity and did believe in the blood atonement, the gospel. But we were mistaking. Uh, excuse me, we were mistaken about 
the meaning of the word world when it says love not the world. Because we thought having a normal life, owning a home, having a job, and sending your kids to school was Babylon, and we had to get out of Babylon. But then, that's not what that is. So here's the word cosmos out of a theological dictionary, and it gives the three big ways that word is used in the New Testament. Actually, also in the Septuagint. Cosmos, the first entry here is world one. The universe, the sum of all created being. So the entire creation can be called cosmos. Well, obviously you can't get out of that. Even if you got one of the first astronauts, they're going to try to send somebody to Mars, I think. Frankly, I'll, I can tell you right now, they're not going to really find anything there. But you'd still be in the world. You'd still be in the universe. Um, and then... Um, you can't leave that, so that's obviously just the creation. And then the second meaning, the abode of humanity, the theater of history, the inhabited world, the place of human affairs. There's where we were mistaken when we joined that group. We thought we had to get out of that part of it and have our own little Christian thing that's not really like the world. Mistaken that is what led to monasticism in the Desert Fathers in the early centuries. And so, don't tell me theology is not practical. I know it is because I harmed my family and myself by being, by what I didn't know that I should have known. And we joined a group we shouldn't have been in. I learned in God's providence, he used it and he's still using it. It's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about truth, having seen the damage that deception causes. But dear ones, we can't just leave the world. We're, we're to be in the world as salt and light and also to be the evangelists of the gospel. But then there's the third one we do get out of. World three, according to these categories, the fallen creation. The setting of salvation history, the human world that is hostile to God. That is what John is talking about. Love not the world. Okay? You're still in the universe. You're still part of the arena of human affairs. But you're not living for the lusts of the fallen world. That simple fact, when I finally realized what that was about, was life-changing for me. Never again tempted to go back to monasticism of any form. And so, uh, I thank God that I had some teachers that warned me. I had to learn the hard way because I didn't listen to them, but later I realized they were right. And we had to finally come to our senses. But let me hear, you might want to turn to this one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. Maybe I can help somebody not do what we did. 1 John 5, 9 through 11. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Always correct me. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. You got to take a preacher but for, by what he means. <laughs> I meant to say... First Corinthians, First Corinthians 5, 9, 9 through 11. Let me cite that. You, you're going to want to know this passage. I'm hoping by God's grace eventually teach through First Corinthians. It says this, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. And then he said in verse 10, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. Notice, before I do verse 11, Paul is literally identifying these categories. World 2 would be just the arena of human affairs, which is full of idolaters, covetous. You get a job, you're going to work with people that are like that. 
You go to school, you're going to learn with people that are like that. If you do anything, you go to the gas station, you're going to run into people like that. Hopefully we're not going to be one of them. But the point is, Paul's making it clear he's not creating uh, uh, an exclusive cloistered group. All right? It's because they misunderstood him. Don't get it wrong. But actually, that he corrects their misunderstanding of what he taught when he told them not to associate with immoral people, verse 11. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Now, Eric has talked about this a lot. That is what the Bible and the Old Testament calls sitting with a high hand. This is what I'm going to do. I have a right to do it. You're not going to stop me. That's sitting with a high hand. That's what Paul's talking about. Because then the church becomes the world, and that's how we live. So don't get it wrong. We don't have to join a convent, but we do have to not live as if we were never saved. Let's go to 1 Peter 4 and verse 2. 1 Peter 4 and verse 2. So this is talking about, let me in fact read verse 1 before I read verse 2. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Then it goes so as to live the rest of of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. To live for the will of God means there's things that we desire that we leave behind. And we just know it has to be left behind. That's living for the will of God. And the word lusts here, again, here's our word. So there's an either or, there's a change. But is a another instance of this strong adversity of. So rather than living in the flesh for the loss of man, but we live for the will of God. So we embrace whatever that takes. If it means not doing what we feel like doing, so be it. God's will is the alternative to epithumia, lust. I have a statement I want to make about this passage. This suffering to be committed to God's will happens because the whole world around us is saying that fulfilling lust is the way to go. We must battle the prevailing winds of worldly thinking that would drag us away from God. So the world says, this is all there is. Live for all the gusto. This is it. Now's the time. God says, no, live for the will of God. And that is central and essential to the Christian life and sanctification. See, if the word of God doesn't inform us, we'll never be sanctified. Because we'll just keep thinking like the world. We need this continual reminder of what's true, why we're here, what we're living for so that we won't be conformed to the world. I have one more slide here. It's 2 Peter 1 4, and here we'll have the gospel. As I'm reading the bondage of the will, I'm seeing again, really, uh, Luther did the right thing when he withstood Rome and talked about promise and law and why we needed to flee to the promises of God because of human inability. I noticed that Luther would use the term gospel and then interchangeably use the term promise. Okay? The gospel brings promise. The law brings threatenings of judgment. We need to flee to the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we preach Christ, we define who we're talking about because there are many false Christ being taught in the world. Christ, the second person of the Trinity, 
is God, the second person, there are three persons, one God, the Trinitarian God of the Bible. Christ preexisted as God and with God. And according to John 1, we've been studying John's writings today, he is the creator uh, and the very creator of the universe came into our world from heaven and revealed himself as the eternal Lagos, the Word. And he spoke the very truth of God. And Christ is not just some religious leader who arose from amongst all the sinners in the world. He's a sinless Savior who was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life. As we quoted earlier in John, he said, I always do the things that please the Father. Jesus predicted his own death on the cross, and he was crucified, as was the manner of the Romans. His Jewish brethren uh, turned him over to be crucified and shouted, crucify him, crucify him. He was rejected by his own people. The world was hostile to him. The Romans crucified him, where he died a slow, painful death, shedding his blood as a substitutionary death for sins. The holy, sinless one died for the sin of wicked sinners like you and I, who were living for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. But Jesus did not only predict his death and the manner of his death, he predicted his resurrection. In the very Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me shall not die, but have the light of life. And so he was raised bodily. And then John, he appeared to his disciples. He ate fish with them. He had a real body. So-called doubting Thomas was, in fact, believing Thomas. In our time, believing it was Christ who had told them that he'd be raised. He said, here, touch my the wounds, touch my side. This is a real body. This is not a phantom body. This is a real resurrection body. The body that went into the grave came out, a transformed resurrection body, and where he ascended to heaven. And this one who died for sins says that we need to believe on him for eternal life. And so what this is all about is turning and repenting, which means no longer living for the lusts of men, lusts of the eyes, lusts of the flesh, most of pride of life, but turning into Christ and living by his grace and his power through the forgiveness of sins for him looking for heaven to escape the judgment that our names be written in the book of life. God promised that the Lord will return that when he does, those who believe in him will be like him. Back in 1 John, 1 John 3, 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet appeared what we shall be like, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Gospel hope is a sanctifying hope, dear ones. Yes, I know we despair. How is God ever going to change me? Have this hope fixed on him. Believe the promises of God. God will change you, and he'll change me. And we hope to be like Jesus. He's coming again. So today, if you have not done so, believe in Jesus Christ and serve him and you will, will be saved. Now today we have a celebration of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is for all who believe and are trusting Christ. So we invite those who are trusting him to come and partake of the table as we are having a supper 
that reminds us of the promise of God that Jesus will eat this anew in the Father's kingdom with us. Now we have um, the bread and the, the grape juice. And so the way we do this is you just, as the uh, ushers release us row by row, and uh, I, th I think the musicians are going to be first here, and uh, we will be coming, <coughs> and then just take a piece of the bread and eat it and, and take a little cup of the grape juice, and then as you do, one, the only thing we need to do is remember the promises of God. I like to think of this. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I, can you imagine we're going to actually do this with Jesus? The very supper of the Lamb? And so, the um, ushers will help you as it's time to come forward here. <clears throat> 